Hello everyone, Victor is here, and in this video I want to talk about the fundamentals of the nomenclature of organic molecules. And we are going to start with the simplest of the molecules, alkanes. And for the most part I am going to be focusing on the IOPAC rules in this video. The IOPAC stands for the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, which is an international body that represents chemistry and related sciences and technologies. It's the world's authority on the chemical nomenclature among other things. And yes, I totally took this definition of their website. But before we go into the naming itself, let's review really quick what the alkanes and cycloalkanes are. Alkanes are the hydrocarbons that only contain single carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. They also do not have any other functional groups in their structure. For instance, we can draw a molecule of methane, ethane, butane and isobutane over here and all of these molecules are open chain alkanes. Alkanes can be either linear or branched and for as long as we have an open chain molecule with only carbon-carbon single bonds and carbon-hydrogen single bonds it is still an alkane. In turn the cycloalkanes are the cyclic versions of the alkanes. They also only contain single carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. But unlike simple alkanes, which are open-chain molecules, the cycloalkanes have ring segments in them. So for instance, here I have the structures of cyclopropane and cyclopentane. And as we can see, cyclopropane is a cyclic three-membered ring, while cyclopentane is a cyclic five-membered ring. In order to start naming molecules, we first need to know the basic building blocks of the nomenclature. Those are the parent or principal names for the chains with the different lengths. The simplest one, with only one carbon, is methane. For two carbons, we have ethane. Then, for three carbons, we have propane, butane for four, pentane for five, then hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, and finally we have decane for 10 carbon chain. And while there are many other names for the longer chains, we'll limit ourselves to just the first 10 examples in this video. Also, in my experience, most instructors will not require you to learn anything beyond the first 10 anyways. And yes, you'll have to memorize those and there is no other way around it. What happens if you need to know the names beyond the first 10, like let's say undecane for C11 or dodecane for C12 or ecosane for C20? Well, you can just google it. It's a rare case when you'll actually need to know anything beyond the first 10 for the exam purposes. If your instructor does indeed require you to know beyond the first 10, well, come back to this video and comment, Victor, you're full of shit, my instructor did ask me for dotetrocontain on the exam, and by the way, dotetrocontain is C42H86. Anyways, back to reasonable chemistry here. All these, as you can see, are all open chain molecules. So how do we name the cyclic alkenes? Well, it's actually very similar. For the cycloalkanes, you'll just add the prefix cyclo to the name of the molecule, which signifies that this is a ring. So for instance, for the three-membered ring over here, I have cyclopropane, or let's say for the five-membered ring, I have cyclopentane, and so on. So any of the names that we have over here on the list, you can stick cyclo in front of it, and that's going to make a cyclic compound instead. Notice that all these names also have the ending ane. And this is specifically the ending for alkenes. So whenever you see a name that ends with an ane, you automatically know that it's going to be a molecule that is only going to be containing single carbon-carbon and single carbon-hydrogen bonds. Different functional groups have different unique endings. For instance, molecules with a carbon-carbon double bonds, they have ending in, they're called alkenes. Or alcohols, they have the ending ol, they are called, well, alcohols. You'll learn more of those later in the course, so don't worry about those for right now. The purpose of this video is to build a foundation that we'll use in the future to add new layers of the nomenclature complexity as we cover more chemistry along the way. 
I actually do suggest you pause this video now and copy these names down as you need them for the rest of the video. As I've also mentioned a moment ago, you'll have to memorize those names anyways. So these first 10 is must know. We also want to remember cyclo for cyclic and we also want to remember that all of our molecules so far are going to have the aim for the ending. You may also want to make flashcard with those to make sure you do memorize those names before the first test. I have never seen an instructor allowing you to bring the nomenclature cheat sheet on the test. However, I can guarantee you are going to see nomenclature on your first organic chemistry test. And unless, of course, your instructor hates the nomenclature and just decides to skip it, which does happen on once in a blue moon, you are still going to need to know the nomenclature for the MCA, DAD, ACS, and any other other exams that you are going to be looking to take in the future anyways. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, our molecules can be branched. In reality, most organic molecules are not just simple chains and cycles. They do contain all kinds of side chains and branches coming off the main stem. So we often call those branches substituents. So get used to hearing this term as well, and I'll be using the term branch and substituent synonymously and interchangeably throughout this video. So how do we call those branches? Well, we're going to construct the substituent's name by replacing the ending ain that we normally would have for the parent with the ending yl, which we pronounce as eel. For instance, the substituent that only contains one carbon, aka the CH3 group, we can call it a methyl group. Likewise, we can do for the rest of our parent groups. So, ethane became ethyl, propane became propyl, and so on. This also works exactly the same way for the cyclic substituents too, if the cyclic compound is a substituent hanging off the main chain. So, instead of the cycloalkane, we're going to call it cycloalkyl group, like cyclopropyl or cyclopentyl, cyclohexyl, etc. So now, when we know our building blocks, Let's go over the actual nomenclature rules and look at a few examples here. First, we'll start with this molecule over here. And by the way, for the rest of this video, I'm going to be using the skeletal or the line structures. So if you're not very comfortable with those, I suggest you pause this video and go review what the bond line structures are all about. I also have some tutorials on this topic, so you may want to check those out as well. So. For our rule number one, we need to find the longest continuous carbon containing chain. For this example, we have five carbon chain, or we can have a six carbon chain, or we can potentially have a four carbon chain over here. And we're looking for the longest one, so we're going to choose the middle one with six carbons. Next, when we already have our longest carbon chain, we are going to number our chain in such a way as to give the substituents the lowest possible numbers. Here, we can number our chain in two different ways. And since we are looking for the numbering system that would give us the lowest possible number, we are going to choose the one on the right because that places the substituent at the carbon number three instead of a carbon number four that we would have if we were to choose the numbering system on the left. Finally, we are going to alphabetize our substituents and append them to the principal chain's name. In this example, there is only one substituent, which is going to be our methyl group, so there is nothing really to alphabetize. Thus, our name in this case is going to be 3 methylhexane. Notice that I have to specify the location of my substituent. Also, when writing your name, we'll separate the numbers from letters by dashes, and if we have multiple numbers, we'll separate them by commas. Do not put any spaces or any other punctuation marks in your name. Later on, you'll learn about more advanced rules that indeed use other punctuation marks, such as brackets, spaces, and other things. But for now, we only know the dash between the numbers and letters and commas between the numbers. That's all. So all of our names are going to be one tremendously long words. Here is another example. First, we are looking for the longest chain we'll have the following options, and this list is far from exhaustive, but I didn't want to waste time drawing all possible options here. We can clearly see that the longest chain has seven carbons on it, 
Notice that our longest chain does not have to be a horizontal one. It can twist and turn and wiggle in all possible ways. So don't just assume that the horizontal chain is your parent. Next, I'll identify my substituents and number my chain. For the substituents, I have a few methyl groups and an ethyl group. Be very careful not to include the parent chain carbons in your carbon count for the substituents. It's a really good idea to carefully circle your parent chain and show a squiggly line for the attachment just like what I did here, just to resist the temptation. So for instance, for my ethyl group, I have one atom and I have the second atom, but I do not include the part of the main chain. So this carbon over here, we do not count that as a part of our substituent. That is a part of the chain. So that's why I even highlighted it in a different color. In terms of numbering, starting from the right will give me the lowest possible numbers. Finally, alphabetizing my groups and adding them to my principal chain's name, we get 4 ethyl 235 trimethyl heptane. And here is something very important I want to point out with this example. We have several methyl groups, so we must say where exactly those methyl groups are. So this is what this 235 is all about. Also, we have three of those methyl groups, so we must say that we have three of those by using the prefix try over here. This is a very important rule and one of the most common mistakes when it comes to nomenclature. Your numbers, we also call them locants, must match the numeric prefix for how many groups we have. So we are going to add a few more pieces of memorization to your list and you want to copy down those ones as well. So when you have two groups, we are going to add prefix die. For three groups, we are going to add prefix tri, then tetra for four, penta for five, hexa for six, hepta for seven, octa for eight, etc. Okay, here is another example. Following our steps, we can see that the longest chain contains nine carbons. This means that our parent's name is going to be nonane. Next, we'll number this molecule from left to right, as this will give us the smallest possible numbers. Looking at my substituents, I see that I have a couple of methyl groups and an ethyl group. So putting it all together in the alphabetic order gives me 6-ethyl-2,2-dimethyl-nonane. And a couple of important points I want to make here as well. The prefix di is not the part of the group's name, so we're not going to count it for the alphabetical order. It doesn't matter how many methyl groups I have, the name still starts with an M, regardless of how many prefixes I put there. So if I put dimethyl, trimethyl, tetramethyl, all of that doesn't matter. The first letter that counts for the alphabet here is still going to be the letter M. Because of that, the ethyl group is going to be at the beginning of my name before methyl groups due to the alphabetic order, because we're looking at E versus M in this case. Second, Although both methyl groups are sitting on the same carbon, we still need to specify this location twice, because each location has to correspond to the numeric prefix that we have. So if I have two methyl groups, I absolutely have to specify that I have two locations over here. That's why we say 2 comma 2 for two locants, and it might seem redundant at first, but think about that as the address for each individual group. And since each individual group must have its own unique address, we are going to say it twice. Now, up to this point, all of our substituents were simple one or two carbon chains. This is obviously not what we are going to see all the time. Occasionally, we are going to see something more complicated, some more complicated group sitting on our parent molecule, and we call those complex substituents, and they have their own nomenclature rules. For two simplest substituents, like methyl and ethyl groups, we cannot have any variations, obviously. However, starting with the three carbon substituents, we can have variations. So, for instance, the propyl group can attach to the parent chain in a linear fashion, like I drew over here. In this case, we are going to call it an n-propyl or normal propyl. Most of the time, the n part is going to be skipped and we are not going to indicate that in the name. Alternatively, however, 
our propyl group can attach to the parent molecule via the middle atom. In this case, we are going to call it an isopropyl, where the isa means isomeric group. A four carbon substituent chain has even more variations. We have a normal butyl, which is just a long chain like that. Then we have the isobutyl, which is our isomeric butyl. We have third butyl and we have sec butyl. So third stands for tertiary and sec stands for secondary here. And guess what? You have to memorize all of those names as well. These are the common names. And the IUPAC allows us to use the common names for C3 and C4 substituents. Those are so-called retained names, so we can freely use them instead of the correct ones, because technically all of these names for the isopropyl, isobutyl, sacbutyl, and uh, terbutyl are not strictly speaking correct IUPAC names, and later on when we talk about the complex substituents, we'll talk about how to properly name them. But for these ones, IUPAC allows us to use those common names, so we'll just stick to those for right now for the simplicity's sake. If we, however, have anything beyond four carbons, like C5, C6, etc., then we do have to use the complex nomenclature, and that goes beyond the scope of this video, and we'll talk about that in another one. Also, another bit that you have to memorize is that the prefix ISO is counted towards the alphabetization, while the prefix third and sec are not counted. So for the alphabetic order, the isopropyl group starts with the I, while the third butyl group starts with the B, because the third part doesn't count. I know there is a lot of memorization here, but learning nomenclature is like learning a different language. You gotta memorize the vocabulary, so there is nothing we can do about that. Now, how does all of that look in an actual molecule? For instance, let's look at this molecule over here. Following our rules, we'll find the longest chain and number it. We'll also need to make sure that we number it in such a way as to give the lowest possible numbers. So if I number it from left to right, then my numbers are going to be 2, 2, 5, 6 and 7. But if I, let's say, were to number it from the right, I would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, like this. So that would give me groups at 2, 3, 4, 7 and 7. And while the first position, 2 and 2, is the same, the second position I have 2 over 3, so the first one wins. Once I have my numbering system done, I need to identify my groups. In this particular case, I have four methyl groups around my molecule and I have one isopropyl group. And finally, alphabetizing my groups, I get 6 isopropyl 2257 tetramethyl octane and see that in this case, the prefix iso is counted for the alphabet and the isopropyl group has to come before methyl groups in the name. Or, for instance, this example. We have the longest carbon chain being 10 carbons in this particular case, and we also have two different four carbon substituents. We have a third butyl and we have isobutyl. We also have a few methyl groups in this molecule as well, which, after proper alphabetization of our groups, gives us 6 third butyl, 7 isobutyl, 2 3 9 trimethyl decane. All right, let's now check out the nomenclature of cycloalkenes. The rules are very similar. So, for instance, this molecule over here has six carbons, so we'll call it cyclohexane. But what if I add a couple of groups to it? Well, my parent is still a cyclohexane. But what are we going to start numbering in this case? So, since the cycles don't really have the beginning or the end of the chain, we're going to number it from the place where our first substituent is, and then we'll go towards the next closest substituent. In this case, I'll start numbering from the top carbon, where I have the ethyl group, and I'll go clockwise towards the other ethyl group. In this particular case, it actually doesn't matter which group I start numbering from, because if I start numbering from the bottom and do 1, 
two, three like that, I still get my substituents at carbon number one and carbon number three. Thus, the name for this molecule is going to be 1,3-diethylcyclohexane. But what if we have different groups in the molecule, like for instance here? We still need to number our molecule in such a way as to give us the lowest possible numbers. Thus, we'll start numbering from the carbon where we have two methyl groups and then continue towards the isopropyl group. This is going to give us 3-isopropyl-1,1-dimethylcyclopentane. So it doesn't really matter how big or ugly the molecule is, for as long as you follow these rules, you'll be able to name anything, or well, almost anything until you learn more rules. And even though we're going to be adding more rules and increase the molecular complexity, the fundamentals are still going to be the same. For instance, this little cutie will be called 4,5-diazopropyl-1,1,3,6-tetramethylcyclodecane. Now, occasionally we are going to face the molecules where our rules can give us two or even more possible names, and since the IUPAC does not allow for ambiguity or multiple names, we have the tiebreakers. The first one is when you have two possible longest chains. In cases like this, we need to see how many different substitutions we have on each of our chains. The more branches you have going off the parent, the more important that chain is going to be. So in this example, I have a situation in which I have eight carbons in each possible longest chain, but the bottom one has four branches, while the top one only has three branches. And as the bottom one has more more substituents, it wins the tie for the longest chain. And another one you're likely to encounter is when you have multiple different ways of numbering your parent chain. In this case, the substituents that are earlier in the alphabetic order will take the precedence and will have to have lower numbers. For instance, here I have a couple of examples. One, which is an open molecule like that, which I can number either from the right side or from the left side and that will give me substituents at carbons number 3 and number 5 both ways. So in this case, due to the alphabetic order, the ethyl group gets the number 3. In the second example, I have a competition again between the ethyl and isopropyl group, and if I were to number it from the ethyl group, I get my numbers 1 and 3. If I number it from the isopropyl group, I also get numbers 1 and 3. So in this case, the ethyl group wins again due to the lower uh, alphabetic order, and because of that we are going to put number 1 at the ethyl group. Remember, if you can't find any difference, the alphabet is going to be your last resort. And this is also something very important to keep in mind, do not check for the alphabet until you have exhausted all other tiebreakers. Your alphabet always must be the very last resort. So is your head spinning from all the rules and details so far? I bet it does. But don't worry, it gets easier with practice. Like when you're learning a new language, at the beginning you have to think about every word and every grammar rule and every exception, etc. But as you practice more and more, the words and constructs start coming easily and naturally. The organic nomenclature is kind of like that as well. So make sure you do a lot of practice to become very good at nomenclature, because as I said, nomenclature is an important part of many exams. And if you're still here, thank you for watching this video till the end, don't forget to hit the like button to help promote the channel, subscribe so you don't miss any of my future tutorials, and I'll see you in the next video!